all the most successful founders, entrepreneurs, business people, they're always told they're crazy or what you're doing is not going to work out. I feel like that's a prerequisite to being successful is people raising their eyebrows at what you're doing. Welcome back to Between Bells, everyone. See that you went to Harvard, that you spent some years at Goldman Sachs. You're then a senior product manager at Jet.com, anchor at Cheddar. Now you have your own media company. What was the motivation behind mm. it? What was the thing that made you feel like, I want to make all of these pivots? I like mean, The common theme for me is that I am uncomfortable with being comfortable. There's always this thrill of the chase and looking ahead to the next milestone. I just want to be in a spot where people want to give me opportunities. They feel great yeah. about it. What is it that you were doing that you think that the people that did give you a shot, they felt confident. They felt good about their decision. They're like, okay, I know she's going to kill it if I put her in position. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think so much of success, especially now with social media and personal branding, all of that, it's so much about... If you close your eyes and you wake up in 20 years, what do you want to see when you open your eyes? Obviously, I don't want to see like awards for work. That's not what I want to see when I open my eyes in 20 years. Yeah, maybe it's like kids. Maybe it's like a life partner. It's like family and relationship oriented, what I want to see versus the career stuff. But why am I putting 96% of my effort into my career stuff now if that's not helping me achieve that goal from 20 years? Hmm. We need to do another episode of like <laughs> life goals. Before we get into the video, YouTube analytics say that 90% of you guys are not subscribed to the channel. If you want to see even bigger guests, better conversations, please subscribe. It really helps us grow the podcast. And with that, onto the video. The Callum Johnson Show. On today's episode, we have Nora Ali. That's me. Nora, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. It's great to be here. I'm so excited. I know. We were talking about the nice weather in New York. It's like <laughs> perfect day to film this. The only way to start a convo is yeah. with the weather. <laughs> When you're in New York and it's nice weather, you have to mention it. It's true, it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, of passage. Okay, here's where I want to begin. Um, so I was actually aware of you from my, like, previous job. Okay. Um, I worked at Public. Yeah. Um, and you were doing, like, a bunch of media stuff also with Public. Yep. And that was when I saw kind of some of the things that you had done. I was like, okay, I, I want to get her on the show. <laughs> and then I kind of... I like looked deeper into your background. Mm -hmm. I was like looking at your LinkedIn and I was like, whoa, like, she is super accomplished. Oh, thank you. Um, I saw obviously that you went to Harvard, uh -huh. um, that you spent some years at Goldman Sachs. Yep. Uh, you were then a senior product manager at Jet.com. Mm -hmm. um, anchor at Cheddar. Yeah. Now you have your own media company. You memorized I just went through your whole resume. LinkedIn. Nice. I know you your don't resume have, better you don't than my have own notes resume. notes in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. Um, and I was just thinking, I think the first thing that came to mind for me once like just got past the accomplishments of it was the confidence and then also the sort of person that would kind of make all of those transitions and um, pivot in that way mm -hmm. and really just embrace like doing something new. Yeah. Uh, which I think is difficult, especially when you kind of build up proficiency in something. So. The first thing that I wanted to ask you was if you were to kind of look at your experience and like your life so far, and you were to think about like the common thread throughout those experiences, and I'm really talking about like, what was the motivation behind mm. it? Mm -hmm. Like, what was the thing that made you feel like, I want to make all of these pivots, like this mm. is something that I do. Mm. What would you say that is? This episode is brought to you by Free Agency. If you want to take your career to the next level, Free Agency is a company that you should check out. They manage and represent talent in the tech industry, and they provide you with a dedicated talent agent to help you find, engage, and win top of market roles that will maximize your earning potential. No more leaving money on the table. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with Free Agency. Anyway, back to the show. I think the, I mean, the common theme for me is that I am uncomfortable with being comfortable. So in any given role, if I felt like I was super, prof super proficient at it, had reached my max, there was maybe nothing terribly different that I could do, then it was, I felt like it was time for me to move on. Mm. And sometimes it would be internally at the company asking for more responsibilities. At Cheddar, for example, I was an anchor, but I also really loved the idea of creating new shows. So I was mm. doing that a lot, which is not necessarily expected um, of your traditional anchor. But in each job, 
from Goldman to Jet, so going from finance to startup, I just felt like there was this this theme buzzing of pe people work at startups now. Startups are the thing. Yeah. Because it wasn't, it's so common now. It's like the default now to work at a startup. But at the time, it was the default thing, at least with my background, working at an investment bank or working in consulting. So to leave that safe and secure job and go work at some early stage startup hadn't even launched yet it was less than 100 employees that seemed crazy mm -hmm. to my coworkers, to my parents um but i felt like that was where i wanted to be because that's where things felt like they were moving towards so that was a great experience and then going from jet to cheddar it was this voice in the back of my head that it told me for pretty much my whole career you should try being in the media space, mm. being a host, because I had grown up performing on stages. I'm a pianist and a violinist. I would MC fundraisers and weddings for family and stuff like that. I just really liked being on a stage and performing, for lack of a better word. So I gave myself basically a six-month runway of, okay, I'm going to reach out to whoever I can think of who's tangentially involved in the media and TV business and also cold DM whoever I can and see if I can make it. Um, so I guess the common thread there is it, there was always this kind of discomfort and like itch in the back of mm. my head. It's probably not the right way to say it, but this feeling that I needed to do something else at every career turning point. Um, and that either meant going to a new job or industry or trying to find something new internally each time. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and the reason I say it's interesting is I have I have a very like similar thing. Mm -hmm. Like I like to switch things up like I yeah. like to feel like I'm like pushing yes. kind of like what I'm capable of doing and sometimes I'll reflect on that because I think it is a great thing mm -hmm. but there's also the other part of it I'll think about sometimes and I'll be like is there ever going to be like enough <laughs> or am I just going to be like 80 years old and they're like yeah no I need to do something else no it's like a real question and it comes up with my therapist all the time because mm. There's always this thrill of the chase and looking ahead to the next milestone and, oh, I'm, you know, I'll be able to relax once I achieve this thing on the horizon. But obviously, when you achieve that thing, you don't relax and you move on to the next milestone. Mm. So I've been trying to generally slow down a little bit, even if that means when I'm going from task to task during my work day or getting up to get a glass of water between meetings. My therapist is like, Nora, just be present, <laughs> mm. slow yourself down, and don't be ping-ponging between things because that's just kind of how I am. I'm always a little frenetic in my head. Um, so yeah, that's that's a good, it can be a good thing to drive you in your career, but it's not necessarily sustainable until you're 80 years old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, that's interesting. You know, you know um, I think one thing I love about like these conversations is, um, just getting like context on the guest. Mm -hmm. It's not only just about like um, like what they're doing right now, but it's like why, like yeah. what are like the deeper the deeper reasons? Like mm -hmm. what's the context? Um, and one of the things that I've noticed definitely for myself, a lot of like our foundation is built during like childhood. Yeah, like a lot of the reason that we do certain things, it mm -hmm. was formed in those initial years. Mm -hmm. So, for you. If you were just going to reflect on like what is like the earliest experience mm -hmm. that you had that like if you told me the story <laughs> everything else that follows would like it would just make sense <laughs> like it kind of explains the story yeah i guess for me there's there's two components to me it's the performance aspect of it which i alluded to and then there's the kind of business boss aspect of it which mm. i feel like i've combined the two now in building an entertainment company. But as a kid, like I said, I loved performing, loved being on stages, loved being the center of attention in my family, I'm a middle, middle child. We have like footage of my dad with his video camera. He'd be filming my little sister who was way cuter than me. And <laughs> he, like camera would be focused on her. And I like t wave my violin bow at my dad. I'm like, what about me? Look at me. And I'm like, just trying to show off the camera. So that was kind of always my thing. Um, and I'm realizing more now that I, I like being behind the camera as well um, and more behind the scenes. But then from the businessy perspective, I was always swindling my family members out of money. Like not <laughs> swindling, but 
if they ask you to do something, be like, well, I'll do it for a couple bucks. And I yeah. remember I had this little Tweety Bird pouch with just dollar bills that I'd collect from my uncles and aunts for like doing various tasks around the house. And my family is very big on playing a game called Nine Cards, which I think might have been made up by my family. I have no idea. But we've been playing for decades and they gamble a little. It's like a dollar here and there. And all the little cousins, my sisters, my friends in my generation, they'd all be playing hide and seek and doing little kid stuff. Mm. And every time I would just sit there and watch my family members like exchange money. I just was always fascinated by money. Mm. And if someone had to go take a break, I'd be like seven years old and like sit and swoop in for them. I'd play with their money. When they come back, I'm like, I made you money. Can I have like 50% of it? Mm. <laughs> of like the profits are like, yeah, sure. So that was always kind of a driving force for me. I don't know why is figuring out how to make money. Um, so I think those are two things that are driving me now, I guess, is being a boss, uh, collaborating with people in order to succeed. And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> collaborating, i.e. Yeah. stealing money from my family. <laughs> we <Well>, started there. <laughs> um, were you like, were you competitive? Yeah. Up? Okay. Fair. So competitive. But I think in a healthy way, because... So my sisters also play music. Um, so we would sometimes be competing against each other in competitions. And if one beat the other, there was literally never any hard feelings. Like I'm not exaggerating. We never felt bad or guilty. Or like, oh, I didn't win this one. Nicole won, whatever. We never mm. cared. Also, my older sister is literally the smartest person I know. So she was always just better <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when it came to being very diligent about schoolwork and she started college when she was 16, just like top of everything, everything, everything all the time. So I was competitive in trying to perform at my best capacity, but mm. I had people around me growing up that were just like top yeah. of everything. So I was comfortable not being the best in the room, which I think helps me a lot now because I, when I enter into new spaces, by default, I'm not the expert and that's mm. what I prefer. So I'm very comfortable hiring people bringing people on board who know better than I do and know the things that I don't know. And I think that is maybe a causal from my childhood and yeah. being surrounded by people constantly who are just in different ways better than me, frankly. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's weird that this just came to mind for me, but like, obviously, so I grew up in London. Mm -hmm. Um, and so obviously football is like a huge part or soccer, mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> I don't like to call it that. But, um, <laughs> Football is a huge part of the culture and the greatest, probably the greatest like football manager, um, Sir Alex Ferguson. Mm -hmm. I remember reading his book um, and he's literally the best at, probably the best ever, I would say most people would say. Um, and he was talking about the importance of like having the best people around you. Like yeah. he was never the best person in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of like a common thread that you hear actually from people who yeah. are very successful. It's that everyone else in their team is actually really smart mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and capable yeah. as well. And there's like a certain confidence, mm -hmm. I think, to being able to do that. Yeah. I um, think the smartest people will tell you when they don't know something. The, the, my, one of my business partners right now, for example, he's a literal billionaire. And he asks what one might think is like, very basic questions a lot of times about how you're building your business or how this industry works. And when he asks you the question, it, it means like you have to understand it super, super well in order to explain it to him because he's looking for it in the most basic terms. Mm. And I think it takes a really intelligent confidence to be able to ask basic questions to understand things like you're five years old, whereas so many people will just nod along when they totally mm. don't get anything They're like, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I I try to stop myself when I find myself just like nodding away when someone's talking at me and I want to take a step back and say, I actually don't understand what you just said. Can yeah. you repeat that in a different way? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I remember even um even cuz I I started out doing strategy consulting. Mm -hmm. And you do this thing called the case interview to like get yeah. the job, get the role. And through that experience because you, you ask all these questions during the case interview. Mm -hmm. And I realized the best question you can really ask is just why. Mm -hmm. It's always like, yeah. um, and it's, it's just something that you, you continue to learn, I think, as mm -hmm. I get older. It's like the simple stuff is actually really where it's at. Yeah. 
Um, Definitely. I think a lot of the time, sometimes we like overcomplicate yeah. or like we look for the thing that's like elaborate or like right, right. more glitzy versus just right. what's simple. Or you try to use jargon and sound yeah. super smart. And I don't like that. Yeah. I don't like people who use jargon just to sound smart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about, um, I'm curious about like the experience of going to Harvard. <laughs> um because i know obviously like someone from the uk you hear harvard that's like the pinnacle <laughs> of everything you're like oh this must be a genius i'm talking to <laughs> harvard um what kind of effect do you think that had on you going to that that school okay where do i begin i i didn't love college hmm. to be honest i so what I loved most about Harvard was finding other musicians who are very serious about playing violin or being an orchestra, but it wasn't their main thing. There are a lot of instrument nerds at Harvard. Those were kind of my people. But I was never very good at school. <laughs> I know mm. it sounds weird like I got into Harvard because that was the competit competitiveness of me. like. In high school, I procrastinated to no end. I was on AOL Instant Messenger all the time, like talking to people I had crushes on. My mom would come find me at like 2 a.m. on the internet, just like not doing schoolwork. <laughs> it's like, well, how did I get into Harvard then? Well, because I had to. I guess I wanted <laughs> to prove to everyone that I could. Um, and like, listen, like I graduated top of my class in high school, whatever. I got really good grades. But then when, once I got to Harvard, I was like, okay, now my goal is to get a job. So I wasn't necessarily studying as much as I should have in school, but I focused so hard in getting the golden internship. And once I was at the internship, being the first to be given an offer, I just need, I needed that. So I think to me, Harvard was basically just an avenue to get mm. to actual work. And I love having a career in working. Mm. I've, I've never enjoyed studying in school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. You it's interesting, like the competitive, mm -hmm. um, the competitive aspect. Because I remember thinking a very similar thing at school, which is, um, I don't know, I think like the, the academic route and people that really excel in that pathway, it's like, um, it's like a specific skill set it almost mm -hmm. feels like. Like even mm -hmm. just understanding like how to revise, like how to study for exams, like how yeah. to do well in exams. Yeah. And some people are so good at it and it comes like so natural they don't even really need to work that much they're just right. it's just very natural right and I remember having a very similar feeling of like um I got like pretty good grades growing up mm -hmm. but it never felt like my thing mm -hmm. it was more that I was like so competitive I yeah. wanted to prove that I totally. could just do something that wasn't actually really my thing yeah um the proving thing is interesting because that's kind of how I chose my major so I mm. Majored in statistics and quantitative finance because I, I, I've loved math. I love math. Like math's always been my thing. But st like getting a degree in stats and quant finance is frankly very hard. And I wasn't necessarily better at it than like, I don't know, other people doing um, this major. But I was like, it's going to sound really smart. <laughs> if I have a degree in stats and quant finance. So I'm just going to do it. And I remember I took my first stats class was a probability class. And at the end of class, they were like, we're having a little meet and greet for people who might want to be stats majors. I think I was a freshman or a sophomore at the time. For people who might want to be stats majors, there's Chinese food being served. I was like, OK, I'm hungry. <laughs> so I literally went for the Chinese food. And then I learned about this quant finance program, which it was only me and one other person who um, graduated out of that program in my year and there were only maybe 10 stats majors total in my year and then every subsequent year it grew exponentially because I think everyone started to realize the importance of knowing how to analyze data mm. <laughs> and the importance of statistics so to me it was kind of to prove like okay not a lot of people are doing this and it's going to sound really good on my resume and I like math so I might as well just do it and yeah. somehow somehow I got through <laughs> yeah you know I wonder if it's like the middle the middle child thing because um <laughs> So I'm the second, like I have, an old, I have an older brother and then quite a few younger siblings. Mm -hmm. And I have a very similar thing, which is like, um, it excites me if someone, if no one else really does it. Yeah. Like yeah. even, so I, I left my job like seven weeks ago to do this full time. Mm -hmm. And 
it's weird like I, I I like the feeling of even when you tell people and they're like they're like looking at you like you're half insane yeah I like kind of I'm like yeah I'm like right this, this yeah like, to like especially to leave something secure and normal to yeah. go do something that's completely off what anyone would think that you would be doing and it's just like whoa how did that happen yeah I love that feeling yeah <laughs> you know I, I specifically I loved the feeling of like um I almost want people to look at it and feel like it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> yeah. But like for me, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Like that all that matters. Like as long as I have the <clears throat> belief that I can do it. Yeah. I kind of like that, that mentality. It doesn't really yeah. make sense to anyone else. I think it's better if it doesn't make sense to other people. Because that's how all the most successful founders, entrepreneurs, business people, they're, all, they're always told they're crazy or what you're doing is not going to work out. I feel mm. like that's a prerequisite to being successful as people... Yeah raising their eyebrows at what you're doing <laughs> yeah i wonder what that is like because there's it's not even i guess that's not what's making them successful it's like the, <laughs> <laughs> that people think they're crazy but it's like there's like um there must be some sort of quality underneath that well it's which because, is then applicable yeah in business, it's because like. they're doing something that other people aren't willing to do they're mm. taking risks they're doing something that's out of the ordinary. You're not going to be extraordinary unless you're doing something that's out mm. of the ordinary. So if you're like, you can be in a very straight career trajectory, stay at the same job forever and be super successful, but you're not going to, people might not write about you and you might not have a memoir necessarily. To, I don't know. It's just, mm. it's, it's different, especially now, I think it's m becoming more and more common to do out of the ordinary things instead of staying in one path. Mm. Okay, so you're, you're, at, um, you're at Harvard. Mm -hmm. You're doing the degree that no one else is really doing. <laughs> um, you've kind of, you've proven yourself in that arena and you're starting to kind of focus on like, you know, like your future kind of career aspirations. Yeah. Where was your mind at when, it, when you thought about your career? And I know mm -hmm. every... Everyone at that age gets asked like, oh, like, what are you going to do? Or yeah. like, what do you want to be? Or mm -hmm. what are you doing after college? Like, where was your mindset even at that point? Were you like very, were you like supremely confident of like, okay, here's the path? Or no way. <laughs> Not even a little bit. So for my first job, it went back to the notion of being able to prove something. So uh, Goldman was the company that I wanted to work at. Um, and I made that happen. Why and was it Goldman? Because that was, it was like, it, I mean, it changes every few years, but like the top investment bank is. But at the time that, I guess that's the name that carried the most cachet mm. for whatever reason. I don't know if it was warranted or not, but that's amongst my peers also, right? You kind of go based on what everyone else is trying to achieve as the top goal. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, if you can like get a job at Goldman, then you're set for life. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, but going back to kind of figuring out when I realized what my life's calling would be or what I wanted to be, there was a time when I was 12, and this is on record, I was 12 years old and I was on this radio show for playing the piano. And the host asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I want to be a CEO. He was like, of what? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I just want to be CEO. So I think I've always had this desire to be a boss or the boss. And I've, I guess, created that for myself now. But to me, Goldman was a stepping stone. And basically, until now, everything I've known has been a stepping stone and not where I wanted to end up. At no point in any of the companies I've worked at thus far was I like, okay, I guess I'll be here forever. Mm -hmm. It was always like, and it'll be like three or four years and then we'll see what's next. But now I feel like I'm doing what I will be doing for the foreseeable future. At yeah. Least. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. 12 years old. This, this year. <laughs> um, I think my, honestly, I think my dad had put those ideas in my head because he was always calling me entrepreneurial. I was like, what does that mean? He's like, because you, you feel, it seems like you can just do a lot of different things. And mm. Like that's when I first discovered the word entrepreneur and here I am being an entrepreneur now. So I think my dad, like he's a, the quiet one in the family because it's three girls, it's three sisters and my mom who's like very loud. Mm. My dad's just kind of this quiet, introverted, jolly person on the side, like rooting us on. But I think he was always my qu like quietest and most vehement advocate mm. and um, cheerleader. 
who kind of knew what I would become ultimately. Mm. And he doesn't get enough credit for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So shout out, Dad. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's um I love that because it's like everyone's story, I feel like, especially if you go on to like uh do like cool things and do mm -hmm. great things that not many people get to do. Um, it starts with like that early believer, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's um because for me it was also my dad. And it's mm. um I think the part that makes it the most meaningful, it's before you've shown any results. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like my dad thought I was gonna do stuff and like <laughs> what I had done to that point wasn't really yeah, there. Right. Um <laughs> it's like they see they see you. Yeah. Right. Everyone just wants to be seen. And there's certain people who are like, I see something in there, even though other people might not see it yet and there's nothing tangible to prove it yet. It's like they just know. Yeah. It's the best kind of person. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like everyone needs that. That that would definitely yeah. be a common thread. Yeah. You were just saying common threads of someone who's like very successful. I think it's yeah being seen by someone. Yeah. And then you just keep aspiring to that. Never really thought that. of that until yeah. now. So thank you. I will text my dad after. And thank yeah. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> my mom gets all the credit. Because <laughs> she's the vocal one. She likes to brag about us. And <laughs> she's like, yeah, I like I have a successful career and I raised my three daughters. Like, well, dad's there too. <laughs> He like gets forgotten. So sad. But he's the best. Your dad needs like a PR arm or something. Yeah. Like someone just needs to get him up. He does. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, <coughs> okay. Let's continue to go through the story. So okay. you you get to um you get to Goldman. Yeah. I'm always curious. Like, what was the feeling? What was the feeling when you got to Goldman? Was there any like satisfaction, or was it like <laughs> I just did it and then just move on? The satisfaction started and ended when I got the offer for a full-time role. And then it was off to the races because I felt like I was always catching up at Goldman because there was always so much to learn, so much to keep track of. And when you're the most junior person on the team, you you do have to show up before everyone else shows up and you leave after everyone else leaves. And I was just in the office all the time, constantly stressed. And I worked on the Asian equities team. So we were working with the Asian offices a lot. So it's a lot of late night emails, super early morning phone calls. So I think I would feel satisfaction if I, you know, pitched some good idea and my boss was like, great work, Nora, or I got promoted or I got a raise or something. It was always tied to these external affirmations and validations mm. which has been a driving force for me through my whole career and something i'm working on very closely with my therapist <laughs> right now is how do you find that satisfaction without other people telling you good job or giving you a promotion or a recognition or an award so that's how it had started and how it kind of was at goldman mm. but after getting the offer and doing the slog my next big moment of satisfaction was telling everyone I was leaving <laughs> <laughs> because they were like, you're going to this random startup called jet.com. Like, okay. And then I think it was the next day after I had announced I was leaving on all the TV screens across the trading floor, jet.com raises a series D of like hundreds of millions of dollars, like founder Mark Lurie, who had sold, Diapers.com to Amazon for $550 million is launching this startup to take on Amazon. They were like, oh, you're working there. That's so cool. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I was I very knew. satisfied with that. <laughs> yeah. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what? Let's stick with Goldman for just a second okay. because I think um, there's a lot of people that are like, they, they followed that pathway, right? Which is, and I know definitely for my peers, I did it similar which is um, in the degree that I graduated from, everyone was doing, wanted to do like investment banking yeah. or strategy consulting. And that's kind of, that's like what you're aspiring to. Yeah. Like you're doing the interviews. And I was actually thinking about this. I remember thinking about it when I was going through it. It's an interesting dynamic they've set up where mm -hmm. like, uh, I remember my friend that did investment banking at City. And he's working like a hundred hour weeks. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting dynamic that Dave, like, you're like so grateful to get this job <laughs> where you're gonna work like a hundred hour week. Um, and like work your face off. And it's like, <laughs> people are like celebrating and stuff and they get it. And I, and I guess it does have a lot of great opportunities. Yeah. Um, 
But I remember something because I have like a like a career like business coach. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I was in consulting and actually when I started uh, working at a startup, she told me that um, in your career and especially like navigating like more like corporate settings, mm-hmm. you have to understand that there's like, it's a game to a certain degree. Because yeah. I think when you're, when you're coming up, you think it's just like, I'll just do the best work <laughs> and they'll know that I'm doing the best work and then I'll get the acknowledgement and the promotions <laughs> and all the projects and everything I'd ever want and the salary. And I remember her s- sitting me down and just being like, cause I was frustrated mm-hmm. um, that I felt like what I was doing wasn't getting recognized and people that were, um, I felt like were playing more of the game were getting the recognition and were yeah, getting the projects. Yeah. <clears throat> and um it was it was a powerful analogy for me because when I think about a game, it's like you need to understand the rules. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't just get to make the rules and then decide that you're the winner. You have to understand the rules and play yeah. by those rules. And so I'm curious from your perspective as someone that worked at Goldman for some time, what were kind of the key things that you just learned that like made your stint there successful, that mm-hmm. allowed you to get that promotion? Yeah. Um, and kind of land it on your feet. Cause I think that's what everyone kind of, a lot of people see that role as is mm-hmm. like, I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna learn a bunch of things and it's gonna set me up in a great way that yeah. I can then elevate to yeah. the next thing. Being pleasant to work with is the most underrated characteristic you can possibly have in any job. And I had the benefit of having a team that was super close knit because we were the Asian equities team. We were just a, a ragtag group of international folks and. We would order food from each other's home countries every Friday and Mm. sorry, we would order food from different places and we'd all order in like our native languages. It was just like a fun, a fun team, but we all liked each other and I made it a priority to always do what I promised I would do and be reliable and trustworthy and just a good person. And that's one of my main values as I'm building a company is I only hire good people who I trust. And that's it. Like you can say, you can call it a game, you can call it whatever. But if you're just truly someone that people want to work with, that's all it takes. And I've Mm. sustained that from Goldman to Jet to Cheddar to now. And I think my greatest strength now is building teams and recruiting people and bringing people on board who can see that it's a very healthy and safe environment that I've cultivated. And I've learned that through my entire career. So that's it. That's the game. Mm. It's just be a good person. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. And do it for real. Like, don't pretend. <laughs> yeah. People really feel the authenticity as well. Yeah. It's something that I've learned is um, people can pick up on just the energy. Yeah, um, for sure. How do you screen for that? Like, even when you're hiring, like, how do you screen for like a good person? Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, I know there's different schools of thought on references and reference checks, for example. <clears throat> but in the world of media and entertainment, it's, it is a small world where everyone kind of knows everyone and everyone's at least heard of a lot of other people. So I didn't do any formal, like, for example, I hired a head of development last summer and she's the greatest person I think I've ever worked with in my life. Mm. And I didn't do any formal reference checks, but I just saw that we had a couple of people in common on LinkedIn and I just did like a quick little reach out like, hey, what are your thoughts on so-and-so person? And it's just when it's an unsolicited, like she didn't tell me to go reach out to those people. I just like found those people in common and they like raved about her. And I was mm. like, okay, like the unofficial reference checks I feel d- says a lot, but if you're just having, going through the recruiting process, there's very basic small things that make a big difference. For example, um, when I was hosting the Business Casual podcast um, for Morning Brew, we were looking for an associate producer, went through a few interviews. Some people remarkably don't send thank you emails after. You'd think that'd just be the default when you're mm. interviewing for a position. And I thought that was just what everyone did, but some people didn't. So it's just very basic things where do you send a thank you? And if you send a thank you, is it specific to your conversation? Are you enthusiastic? Mm. You can just tell when people mean it and care Mm. (laughs) versus when they're just doing it to go through the motions and it's i mean sometimes it's pretty nuanced but as long as you're authentically if you're enthusiastic about something and you're honest about it then it'll absolutely come across when you're going through the process of trying to find your next role yeah it's interesting actually um like in my career 
I've learned that like uh, what you spoke about caring that's like a huge <laughs> differentiator yeah like just people that truly care and I think the reason it's a differentiator is because the amount that you care it shows itself when no one else is watching. Mm. So like, yeah. how are you in the meetings with like people where there's not someone senior or not someone that you're trying to like get FaceTime with or whatever? <laughs> like, how do you behave? Because I think the people that truly care, they're like that all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it doesn't <clears throat> just show up in spots. Um, yeah. And I think that's why they get great feedback mm -hmm. from people is because they're consistent yeah. throughout. <laughs> And people can feel that. Definitely, yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about, like, you're leaving Goldman now. Mm -hmm. How does that even come about? Was there, like, was there a certain milestone that you hit and you're like, okay, time to go? <laughs> was it, like, the, the job just came about? Like, how, how did it all come about? I'm trying to remember how it all happened. I think I had just gotten promoted to associate, and that felt like a good... It, like I had I had ach achieved something <laughs> while I was there right I got mm. promoted and my boyfriend at the time was in venture capital so was surrounded by founders and entrepreneurs all the time and would just like talk about that world a lot and I don't think I would have been exposed to that world if not for him um and he said you should maybe like look into working at a startup it, going back to being seen like my dad recognized the bossness in me mm. my ex-boyfriend recognized the wanting to or the ability to help create something from scratch mm. in me um because what i guess what i had probably voiced to him was one of my greater frustrations at goldman is that i felt like i wasn't actually creating anything mm. because we were doing equity sales so you're talking to institutional investors about what they should buy and sell and guiding them through IPOs and stuff. So you're, it's information sharing um, and curating, I guess, mm. for other people, but we weren't creating anything. Mm. So a startup would make sense for me at the time. So yeah, I just heard about various um, startups that were hiring and Jet was super, super early. He had known someone who invested in it. So like no one was talking about it at the time. So then just I just sent my resume over for no role in particular. And I think that worked in my favor because it's not like I had startup experience or tech experience or anything, but they were at the time looking for generalists who were very smart and could, could do anything and be entrepreneurial. Mm. Um, so that ended up working out. And honestly, what got me to actually make the leap to work at Jet was good people. Everyone that I interviewed with, I was like, wow, like I feel like we really vibe and you guys actually all really care about mm. the mission of this company. And by the way, it was a very big jump to make, not just because I was going from a well-paying <clears throat> job in an investment bank to now getting paid maybe half of what I was getting paid. I was also having to go to Montclair, New Jersey <laughs> and like <laughs> take NJ Transit <laughs> every morning. That is tough. <laughs> I know it's not that bad, but for someone who doesn't like to leave my radius of like a couple blocks, it was a big deal for me. Um, and it was like the office itself was janky at the time because it was a tiny startup and we it was spread across two buildings across a parking lot shared with a pizza joint so in the winter we would have to wade through snow to get from meeting to meeting um and it was just not like the best physical <laughs> experience <laughs> but i loved the people and the mission so much that i was like i have to do this Mm. And I feel like I'm going to, I will feel FOMO if I don't take this job. And yeah. I'm just so happy I did. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, something that you've said, which um, has kind of shone through almost everything that you've said is um, you mentioned even with your current company, you love like your head of development. Yes. Um, your first job in finance, mm -hmm. you loved your team. Yeah. Um, the next job at jet.com, you loved the team there. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I remember feeling this feeling when I was at my first job, which is um, the people were nice and we got along, mm -hmm. but it didn't feel, it didn't feel like my people. Like mm. it didn't feel like I had found, because <clears throat> uh, I really think that takes the work experience to a different level. Yes. Was when you feel like this is kind of like my tribe, like this yes. is kind of my <laughs> people. Totally. And so, and I, and I think it's a common thing that people are, they're doing a job 
yeah. but they don't really feel like it's quite them. Yeah, maybe yeah. just in terms of the tasks <clears throat> that they're doing, the people that they're working with, mm -hmm. and so. What do you think has allowed you just to kind of be in spots? Do you think it's just like a luck thing? Like it just kind of <laughs> happened? But it doesn't feel like that to me. It feels yeah, like it was almost it's, intentional. It's, it's what informs my choices. Hmm. For Goldman, for example, like I did the internship. The point of the internship, it's t 10 weeks and you rotate through three different teams and <clears throat> you rotate through three different teams and the goal is to get an offer from one of the teams that you rotate through. And I had gotten two offers at the end of the summer and I got, I was lucky enough to be able to choose which team I wanted to work for. And it was, the decision was clear to me because I loved my Asian equities team. Mm. And I knew I would just be happier going to work every day with them than the other team was fine, but I didn't feel like they were my people, my tribe. And then at Jet, that's why I chose the job is because I liked to be able, there were other startups I could have gone and worked for, but I just really felt like the culture was my culture at Jet. In fact, two of my best friends to this day, I met at Jet. And I think what's really important, and it's much harder now with work from home and remote work and all of that, but hanging out with your coworkers. Mm. I know some people believe in separating that, like your, your coworkers are not your family. Like, I think it's silly when people say you're, co you're coworkers are family but you can be very good friends with your coworkers and i have found some of my best friendships at work and it just becomes more enjoyable to show up to work if you have gotten brunch with them the last weekend or you're sharing things about your personal life and they know about your family and i remember at jet um my older sister was pregnant with my niece mason for whom my company is named mason media and so this, that should go to show how important of a person she is in my life. My whole team, in fact, the whole floor knew that Nora's sister is going to give birth soon. Nora's going to have her first niece soon because I <laughs> talked about it constantly. I had this like gift that I was making for my sister at the office. So when I got the call that my sister was going into labor in Connecticut, I was like, it was like 11 a.m. in the middle of the work day. I was like, I got to go. And everyone's like, yay! And like cheering <laughs> me on. I'm like grabbing my bags and like going to the train station. Like it felt like no one cares that I was leaving work in the middle of the day because they knew I'd get my work done. And everyone yeah. was just rooting for me and my family. It's not like I was having a kid. It's like my sister was having a kid, but everyone cared so much. It's like really nice. So yeah, that, those are the kinds of environments that I love. And now my employee, Amanda, she has two kids. She has to randomly leave because a kid's sick or something happened at school. I'm always like, oh, my gosh, like, take all the time you need. I don't care. Do what you need to do. She sends very apologetic notes, which mm -hmm. I think is really cute, actually. But I'm like, I know she's going to get her work done. She's such a beast. Mm -hmm. I don't care when she does it or how she does it. So I think that's the kind of safe environment that will help anyone thrive in, in the workplace is if you feel like you can be yourself, do your thing when you need to do it and no one's micromanaging you or watching over you. Yeah. It's nice when it's like, um, I think about that sometimes. It's like, uh, especially when you're, when you're thinking about business and starting your own company, um, it's like your ideals and like the compassion mm -hmm. versus just the, like the raw results of the business. Yeah. And I think it's sort yeah. of, something that you, I kind of go back and forth with sometimes because we hear a lot of stories of entrepreneurs and even like a Steve Jobs or like mm -hmm. a Jeff Bezos will come to mind um, that they create these amazing things, but they're also like ruthless in a lot of ways. <laughs> like there's, there's like, um, right. and I think we all have it to a certain degree, uh -huh. but there's like, a, there's an, a clear edge to them. Yeah. Um, and... I feel like the the culture that those that it's almost fostered is like sometimes you just have to just you can't always treat people like kindly. Mm. Sometimes it's just about this is what the business needs mm -hmm. and it's unforgiving and it's tough <laughs> and you they just have to suck it up. Yeah. Um Yeah. What do you think about just like leading I guess like it's almost like leading with compassion in in yeah. business and being able to do that but still get results? I I don't believe in any amount of ruthlessness when it comes to leading a company. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I have a ruthless bone in my body. I just 
in every experience I've had, if I like my boss and I respect my boss and they trust me, I will perform above and beyond. Mm. And I'm trying to give that back. If I am someone that you enjoy reporting to and working for and with, I know you're going to go above and beyond. It's almost like going back to proving yourself. Like if you have someone that you look up to, you want to prove yourself to them. You want to deliver for them. And I don't think it takes any amount of ruthlessness to to get there. And as someone who's building a company, I have funding that I have to manage. I have to do budgets and projections and we're going to be launching into fundraising soon. My priority, and I've literally said this to our accounting team, I've said it to my investors, my number one priority is making Amanda happy and being making sure she gets paid and she has a trajectory for the long haul at the company because she is the person who's making it all happen. So I don't know. I don't feel like I need to be ruthless at all as long as mm. I'm informing everyone that it is my priority to make sure I'm taking care of my team. And I'm not going to necessarily say it. I mean, I did maybe say it to Amanda. I was like, you're my priority. But it's like, <laughs> yeah, making sure she feels like she is going to be taken care of. That's all it takes. Mm. Now, it just seems so simple. Mm. I don't understand why anyone has to be mean at mm. work. I don't get it at all. Yes, I've had conflicts where people at other companies maybe are not great to work with. But there's ways to do it um, without creating enemies. I don't mm. know. I don't know. Maybe I could be a little more ruthless. <laughs> now I'm like, wait, I'm like too nice. Shoot. <laughs> we do another interview in a few years. You're just a completely different person. Know, yeah. It's like, I really reconsidered after that. Yeah. My alter ego comes out. <laughs> All your staff just hate this podcast. Yeah. They're like, I got fucked up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, that's interesting. You know, you know, um, when you were talking, it's weird. Sometimes I'll be in these conversations. I'll have like realizations <laughs> as I'm listening to someone speak. Mm -hmm. And um, you said um, like there's no there's no need to be ruthless. And mm -hmm. it kind of almost maybe it comes back to that um, like you proving yourself. Yeah. And it made something click in my mind, which is um, one of the really powerful moments for me in my life was and we and we spoke about it earlier is. Um, my dad like showing that belief in me before I was ready. Yeah. And at the time that he did it, he would constantly tell me these things and like how I need to be disciplined and be in routine and mm -hmm. be structured because I'm going to, um, and at the time it was school, like I was going to get these certain <laughs> grades because uh, I was always a very average student. <laughs> um, and he was like, yeah, we're going to get these grades and this is how you're going to do it. And at the time I was like, I was like, yeah, dad, like, cool. <laughs> And then it actually started to happen. Mm -hmm. And I loved that switch of going from like, you're just trying to impress your dad to this is actually my thing. Like I mm. take pride in this personally. Yeah. yeah. Um, like this is yeah. something I put work into and I build. Yeah. And it was interesting when you said, maybe it comes down to like even proving, proving yourself. Mm -hmm. It clicked in my mind. I was like, I love also seeing that feeling with someone else like if mm. there's um i'm starting to hire people for like my business mm -hmm. and when you take someone that didn't think they would be able to do something yeah and you just keep showing the belief and you have like mm -hmm. you give them the feedback <clears throat> and you have the calls with them and you put that time in just together with them yeah and you just slowly start to see their confidence yeah, yeah. build <clears throat> it's actually yeah. a beautiful process and when you said that it made me think I was like, in a way, you're almost like you're paying forward what mm. your dad gave you mm. in a way. Yeah, yeah. It's like that experience he gave me, I'm giving that to someone else. Yeah, yeah. And I think I have realized the power of saying out loud what you're thinking when you're proud of your employee, you're thankful for them and they've gone above and beyond. I try to go out of my way to say those things to Amanda and whomever else I'm working with because I realize when people point that out when I've done something that I didn't think I could do before I'm like whoa like that gives you so much more confidence than mm. you think a couple of words or a sentence would so I think that's a really good point is like just making sure people know when they're doing a good job mm. and having that that feedback loop 
I don't have formal like a re formal review system yet because I only have one full time employee. So that's going to be a very important thing that I want to set up as I hire more people is a process where people actually know how they're doing because mm -hmm. I know what it feels like to not know how you're doing. So yeah, yeah. You know when I was um when I was looking at your LinkedIn and I really liked your bio by the way. Thank you. It was like it was just different because <laughs> I feel like usually people just list off like what they've done. Yeah. And yours was different. And uh there was one word that you just repeatedly used throughout. Yeah. Which was access. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know like why why is that such an important word to you? Mhm. Mm Every opportunity that I've had in my career and otherwise is because someone gave me access who didn't have to give me access or opened a door for me. And that means at whether it's going to jet.com where I didn't actually have experience in tech, I got the job and then I transitioned into new teams and roles because other people just believed in me and knew that I could do the job without having done it before. And then going to Cheddar all happened because this talent agent decided to respond to my LinkedIn DM and open the door to go audition for Cheddar. And then this new company that I'm building, I can't share all the details right now, but someone who I worked with in the past opened the door and said, let's build something together and I'll give you some funding up front. So every opportunity I've had, yes, I've, I've fought for it. I've cultivated relationships to be able to get that access, but it's always somebody giving me a chance. So I want to do that in return. And every piece of content, every show that I make, everything I develop with my entertainment company now has some lens of giving access to someone who otherwise wouldn't have it whether it's elevating historically excluded voices or working with newer talent, newer producers who haven't been given a shot elsewhere, giving a platform for people who wouldn't have access anywhere else. And man, it's just, it's everything is how you set yourself up, how you set yourself up to get access to grow and then giving that back. So I feel like I'm in the giving back phase right now with my life, mm. hopefully. <laughs> mm. I remember something that my, um, my mom always used to tell me she said, um, people help people that help themselves. Mm. And so when you talk about giving access, I actually think there's two sides to it. There's obviously the person needs to give you the shot. Yeah. But then there's also just people that people tend to give them shots. Like people tend <laughs> to, um, there is something there yeah. with that person that yeah. you're like, okay, yes. I feel like I can give this opportunity. Yes. So if I'm, if I'm the listener, uh -huh. And I'm like, I just want to be in a spot where like people want to give me opportunities. They feel great yeah. about it. Yeah. What is it that you were doing that you think that the people that did give you a shot, mm -hmm. they felt confident. They felt mm. good about their decision. They're like, okay, I know she's going to kill it if I put mm. her, if I put her in position. Yeah. That's a very good question. I think so much of success, especially now with social media and personal branding all of that it's so much about how you can tell your own personal story and how you come across it's how you communicate more than what you communicate so i think in, one of the skills that i've worked on the most in my entire life is interviewing like on both sides of the mic of the microphone but how can you pitch yourself really well in a room where you don't have the prerequisite experience how can you, for example, the fact that I perform piano and violin and was on stages all the time growing up came up with way more frequency than you would think when I was interviewing for investment banking jobs because I was interviewing for sales jobs. And they're like, well, are you good in front of people? I was like, yeah, I'm good in front of people. I'm literally in front of like 40,000 people is the biggest crowd I've ever performed in front of. They're like, oh, that's so cool. And also just being unique and having a unique background, I think people love especially. Um, and just knowing that I worked super hard at playing music and really refining that skill. Um, and you can apply that to learning new skills at these jobs. So if you have your elevator pitch of who you are down really well and can communicate that you have in the past been in new spaces and learned new things and learned them well, then people will be confident to give you a shot. 
And anytime someone does give you a shot and you take it, prove them right for having given you the shot and make sure you follow up with them. Just send a thank you. Keep them updated on progress at this job that they open the door for you mm. for. Um, what I love the most is getting emails from people where they're like, hey, thank you so much for your advice on this one thing like a year ago. This is what I'm doing now. X, Y, Z. It's been great. Thank you so much. Like they didn't ask me for anything. So so often when you're at the mentor phase, people are like, can we, can we catch up for 15 minutes? Can I pick your brain? Like, f fine. Sometimes I have time to do that. But I love just receiving an email where there's nothing for me to do in mm. response to it. They're just updating me, saying thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> like, that's a, like, wow. I love this so much. <laughs> so just, yeah, continue to communicate with all the people who have ever given you a shot. It makes such a big difference. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. <laughs> you know, um, the elevator pitch is like so important, right? It's so hard. I'm not, I'm still not good at it. It's yeah. so hard yeah really hard it is, it is so hard and i think it's um it's just a hard it's a hard thing to answer like um if someone says like tell me about yourself or <laughs> like what do you do i don't know it's like you're instantly on the spot you're like I know. You're like um <laughs> i still get i've done it so much i get nervous every time i'm yeah. at a networking event or at a party meeting you people be like what do you do i'm like oh, oh well it depends <laughs> depends on who you are, right? Like, and you, yeah. you kind of change your story depending on who you're talking to in the context and the environment. Um, so yeah, it's something that I think it's worth practicing out loud to yourself, as cheesy as that sounds. Yeah. Um, and make it, that's why my, honestly, that's why my LinkedIn bio is about access because I feel like everything I do has to have some element of giving access to other people. So that helps inform any decision I make. Like that's my own personal elevator pitch for myself. I'm not going around like in elevators telling people like, <laughs> I am all about access. <laughs> like I'm not doing that. But I think it just helps keep me grounded in what, what matters to me and what my values are. And then the elevator pitch I tell other people in different contexts, there's, there's some level of that woven in, but it just makes me remember who I am at the yeah. end of the day. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you know, back to what we were saying about um, like simplicity, like things being simple. Yeah. And, and those are the best things. Um, one thing I've gotten into personally, I like to boil things down to like one word. Mm -hmm. So like even when um, I think about like what I want to achieve in like this year for 2023, yeah. I want to I want it to be summed up by one word. Like there's mm. something that can it almost uh, it carries the thread like everything will be in that mode yeah and and i think that's why I, I resonated when you said um like access yeah and i'm curious like when when did you realize that that was such a word like such an important word for you because yeah. i'm sure that it was always it was present yeah but like to have the clarity to be like that's the word yeah yeah um it actually happened when i was coming up with my company values um, and I realized that it's not just how I want to build my company. It is literally the word that has informed my entire career. So I was literally going through the exercise of what are the three values, the three words that embody the company and access just stood out as the top one for everything. And access has another meaning in my current job is when you're in entertainment and you're creating new shows, you're always looking for new IP. You're always looking for ideas that other people don't have. And if, if you have access literally into worlds, into stories, into talent, into authors, into journalists that other people aren't paying attention to or don't have access to, then you're, autom you're gonna succeed as an entertainment company. So that's part of what we are trying to do as more people who are embedded in the worlds of tech and innovation and entrepreneurs between myself and my co-founders, more so than your incumbent like Hollywood producer, we think we have unique access that other people don't have, which helps you stand out. So access can mean two things. It means giving other people a chance, but it also means being able to differentiate yourself if you have access yourself to spaces that other people don't have. It just mm. holds so much weight, that word. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Love that word. Yeah. It is so important. It is so important. And even when you're, um, I said it earlier in the episode, but it's so true. Like when, when I was younger, I really did just think it was all about like, 
the people that perform the best are getting the best results <laughs> but the access is such a huge piece the like yeah. the relationships the rooms that you're in mm -hmm. and it doesn't um even me being able to be in america it's because my mum was here mm, yeah like um we don't even take it to that point of yeah. like even the fact that i grew up in london is like that's a really unique experience yeah. like you're kind of a few steps ahead just from being in that environment and like what that will pull from you mm -hmm. um yeah. like the access kind of goes it goes everywhere yeah and i do think that um on the other side of it i think another word that's meaningful to me and i think about this a lot is mm -hmm. like preparation mm -hmm. is that when your when your opportunity comes i i hate the feeling it's like one of my things that i'm like this cannot happen <laughs> is the opportunity comes and i wasn't prepared yeah it's like oh the gosh. worst thing yes <laughs> especially if you knew that was like that was like a big thing totally. that just and you missed it like i can't think of any <laughs> it's like uh you're just kicking yourself yeah and so um i'm curious like how do you stay prepared like what are you doing in the moments where it's not necessarily like i don't know the big meeting with the person that's going to invest in your company or mm -hmm. it's not the person that's interviewing you for the next job mm -hmm. like how are you just staying prepared like what other things are you doing in your life mm. that when your moment comes Ooh. you can capitalize interesting um well i am a vehement over prepare like oh my gosh i over prepare for everything <laughs> everything that is important um yeah, I think I like to take notes on what I think are questions that people are going to ask me in advance of when they're going to ask me those questions. So, for example, I am gearing up for fundraising soon and we're in like very early stages of it. And I'm just anytime I can think I think of something that someone might ask me, I'll jot down that question and kind of start to answer it. And I just I'm not that organized of a person which surprises some people, but I have just endless Google Docs. I use Notion for my to-do lists. And I just, I just info dump all the time. And I think that really helps me feel like I'm over-preparing. I probably have undiagnosed ADHD. I don't know. But if I don't write something down immediately, I will absolutely forget it. So yeah, constantly just asking questions proactively that I think are going to come up. And just going in rabbit holes of research on things um, that I might not need to know at this current moment, but I know I will have to know later. But that's also a balancing act. Where I was first starting this company, I was like, I have to know how everything works. I need to understand the mechanics of production. I have to understand how exactly what day the money flows when you're like <laughs> on a set for some show that you're producing, whatever, and all the margin, like all the things. I thought I had to know, ev know everything. I really stressed myself out. Um, so I think there is a balance to being prepared, but not bombarding yourself, feeling like you have to know everything. There is some value into crossing that bridge when you get there. Hmm. And honestly, some of my best meetings have happened where it just happens and I wasn't prepared for it. And I have to think off the top of my head. Sometimes that just works out better. Hmm. At Cheddar, we would do dozens of interviews in a given day. It was almost impossible to actually prep for every interview. In fact, sometimes a guest would cancel. During the commercial break, the producer gets in your ear. They're like, we actually have a totally different guest coming up in 30 seconds. And you're like, what? <laughs> All you know is their name and their title. And it's in the prompter. And then they're like, go ahead and just do an interview. And those are some of my best interviews is when mm. you're just like, you're actively listening, which I can tell you're very good at. And you're asking questions that come to mind in the moment versus like, oh my gosh, I prepared all these questions. I have to ask them. Like mm. that just doesn't go well. So it is, a, it's a delicate balance of being overprepared, but letting, letting the spirit move you yeah. sometimes and letting the wind take you away. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually so much, uh, it's like a power in just being present. I yes. Think. Yeah. Um, Definitely. You know, one of the, one of the things when I, when I saw your resume and it's funny, actually, I'll, I'll tell you this. So on the way to, um, on like the way here to, to film this episode, I always like to start every episode and I'll like, obviously I've done research on the guest mm -hmm. and I've kind of looked at the resume, everything that they've done. And I love podcasts where they get like right to it. <laughs> I don't like it when it's like, oh, 
what I, I didn't even know like <laughs> it starts like Tell kind of slow <laughs> yeah and then and then like minute 30 it gets to the good right, stuff right, I'm like right. no we get the good stuff right yeah, from minute one and totally. it carries the whole way through yeah and I was thinking about I was like where do I want to start this this episode and um as I do I called my mom and I was like I was like okay I was like I kind of gave her like the rundown and oh I, love that. Oh, I was gonna give her the rundown but <laughs> my my sister answered okay and she's 15 so I gave her the rundown and then I was like um I was like what do you think is something interesting that I could ask <laughs> and she's like a teenager so she's like like I don't know um <laughs> and one of the things that she kind of picked up on uh-huh. was obviously just like and I think it hit her immediately is the fact that you've done so many different things mm, mm-hmm. um <laughs> and she's like why don't you just ask her what made her want to do that and I'm like yeah I already thought, <laughs> thought that question um yeah, it's really like, cute. anything else <laughs> and she was like um I guess I'm I'm interested to go deeper into like when you make that switch mm-hmm. and you're the newbie again, you're like mm-hmm. the rookie, you're the, you know, you're you're walking into um jet.com and you're like the mm-hmm. new person in the office. Yeah. Or you're walking into uh Cheddar, and I remember listening to you say this in an interview where you were like, um like the talent agent that initially kind of helped me get that role did not expect that I was gonna get it. <laughs> And so when you're kind of the person in the room that's new or even when you're starting your company yeah. and you're like, you know, you're preparing and you've got all this stuff going on. You're like, OK, I'm going to do the CEO thing now. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about that initial learning curve. Yeah. And, and the reason I ask, I really actually ask for my um, for my sister and people that are in um, and especially girls and women and who mm-hmm. are just like the the feeling of being new and just not really knowing is so um it's such a hurdle it's such an obstacle that it makes you feel like I just I just don't want to be in that position so Mm -hmm. I'll stay doing what I was doing before Mm. because at least that's comfortable to me at least I know that and so yeah maybe you can speak to those initial moments and kind of what gives you confidence that you can navigate those initial moments starting something new Great question. Also, shout out to your sister. She sounds super cool. Um, it's really scary. Like the first day on a new job in a new industry is so terrifying. But what has worked well for me is going back to what I said about being pleasant to work with. Mm. Just talk to people, make friends, have lunch with someone on your first day if you can. I remember my first day at Jet, I was... Like my first day at Goldman was fine because I had been an intern with a lot of my analyst class. So I knew people going into it. But my first day at Jet, I knew basically no one. And I had to take this New Jersey transit to Montclair, (laughs) New Jersey. And I remember the HR person who helped onboard me was like, oh, you know, the most of the people on that train are going to be Jet employees getting off at the same stop. So just make sure you chat with some people when you get off the train. And I took that as mandatory <laughs> and I was stressing for like the whole night. I was like, I, and I'm, I'm introverted. I'm an, I guess an extroverted introvert or whatever. I get kind of self-conscious when I have to meet new people. So I'm like, I have to make friends on this walk, this 10 minute walk from the train station <laughs> to the office. So I get off the train and my heart is going to fall out of my butt. And I, I'm like looking around at who's the friendliest person that I can possibly see. Everyone's like got their headphones in, drinking their coffee in their own worlds. I just like turned to the girl next to me, I'm like, "Hi, I'm Nora. I'm new. I'm new. Who was your name?" <laughs> and her name's Jess Anarella. To this day, we're really good friends. <laughs> um, and she just talked to me on the way to the office, and I felt like I had a buddy that I could ask questions to during the day. So I think just becoming friendly with people, not just on a coworker level, but a friendship level, just makes the world of difference. And at Cheddar, I made sure I got to know the anchors really well and got to know the producers probably better than some of the anchors knew the producers pretty quickly. Um, and then people will just start to give you slack if you don't understand something. If you become friendly with someone and you ask a dumb question, they're not going to think you're dumb. They're just mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, I like Nora. Let me help. Let me help her with yeah. this. Let me go out of my way to help her. So it all comes back to just being someone who people want to work with like that is my takeaway for today yeah (laughs) and you can succeed in any new environment whatsoever (laughs) yeah that's such a great message as well um 
you know what um what's interesting actually like when i listen to you and you're you're talking through each um role that you did mm -hmm. it's like this journey of getting closer and closer to like what you were meant to do <laughs> yeah. right like yeah. you even mentioned um like going from goldman to jet it was like i want to create something i want to build something of value yeah and then even going from jet to cheddar mm -hmm. it's like it's taking in the experience you had as like a violinist and like mm -hmm. as a performer and yeah. being on camera and then we get to your current venture and it's like the 12 year old that said i want to be ceo and like now it's happening yeah yeah um now that you have that mm -hmm. like how does that feel <laughs> <laughs> it's such a roller coaster let me tell you i have experienced while building this company some of the most anxious moments of my life i've had a lot of anxiety i restarted therapy because i I had been in therapy, I'm, I'm sorry I bring up therapy a lot, it's just very important to me. Um, but I had started therapy many years ago and then stopped therapy during the pandemic because that was I was at Cheddar. Like I feel like I had regulated everything in my life. I kind of knew what to expect every day and it was fine. My therapist and I mutually were like, we're, we're cool now, we'll just like, we'll take a break. And I started building this company, I'm like, I need, I need her again <laughs> because you, I mean, any founder can say this. Like you just you feel like you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> mm. There's no guidebook on how to start a company. And I have felt some of the lowest lows. Um, and then at the same time, I'm like, sometimes I take a step back. And I recently started putting together our pitch deck as we're getting ready for fundraising. Looking at all the things that we've accomplished, I'm like, oh my gosh. I feel like I haven't known what I'm doing this whole time, but like I made that happen. Mm. Not me myself with my own hands necessarily i hired my head of development i have this team of agents at uta who want to work with me i have an entertainment attorney who is has been called formidable by other people who've been <laughs> in this industry for a long time and she likes working with us i have an accountant who i love so much and is like so passionate about the company he's like i want to invest like you let me know when you're fundraising because i want to put some money in just like i have brought these people together even though so much of the time i'm like who am i to be trying to be a hollywood person and like insert myself into this industry so yeah i just feel like it's been a lot of ups and downs moments of satisfaction like i feel like i'm making it not made it but making it and then other times i'm like wouldn't it be easier just to like be employed by yeah. someone else and have a job and be able to clock out at 5 yeah. p.m so yeah it's a lot it's i don't know i feel like that's just life though yeah you know i don't think anyone ever feels like i've made it yeah <laughs> i'm done <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it's interesting what you say about like the the anxiety mm -hmm. because when i um I remember the first few weeks and, and you'd I'd still get it now definitely mm -hmm. but especially strong the first few weeks after I left my job to do my own thing mm -hmm. I was like the anxiety was like <laughs> big yeah and I think for me it was like um it was like the salary thing mm. like you get used to having the I remember there's a, there's a quote I think it's the the most addictive thing in the world more than like drugs or cigarettes or alcohol is like a salary <laughs> Because every two weeks you get the expectation of like sure, yeah. money is coming in the account every two weeks. Uh -huh. um, and when you didn't have when you didn't have that, you kind of had to go out and get it all for yourself. I remember yeah. that was like, yeah, yeah, that was like anxious moments for me. Totally, um, totally. But I'm curious for you, like what was. Where do you think that anxiety was stemming from one and then also. Was the anxiety greater than the anxiety you felt starting all of the other new things that mm -hmm. you had done throughout your career, mm -hmm. uh, what would you say? Yeah, the anxiety starting a company was magnitudes higher than the anxiety <laughs> of anything else. I mean, I guess I, for, I forget. It's, it, this is how we deal with trauma as humans, I guess, is you forget certain things so that you can move on, right? I forget that when I was at Goldman, I had tremendous anxiety, so much so that I got shingles, stress-induced shingles. Do you know shingles? It's, I've a, heard of it. it's like what old people get. It's like when the chicken pox virus is still in your body, like mm. you can only get shingles if you've had chicken pox before, I think. Um, 
and I got shingles on my leg. There was an in-house doctor at Goldman because they do everything they possibly can to keep you in the, in the building. Yeah. So I go to the doctor, I'm like, explain my symptoms. And he said, before I even take a look, I can tell you that you have stress-induced shingles because ever since I started be being a doctor at Goldman, that's the first time I ever saw shingles in anyone under the age of 50. Because wow. it's usually like an old people disease. And I was like, whatever, 22 years old. Because I remember a very specific conversation with a VP that really stressed me out. It's probably not specifically that convo, but that like was the beginning of being super stressed about something. Hmm. Um, so like I'm certain I was super stressed and anxious back then. But I feel like the consequences weren't as great as they are now or the stakes weren't as high. Mm -hmm. So it feels more elevated now. To your point about salary, I was lucky enough to be given funding up front for this company. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate enough to be able to pay myself money. But now having an employee who has two children, I'm like, I can't believe I'm responsible for your livelihood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like if we don't make money, if fundraising, if we don't succeed, like I'm going to have to tell you <laughs> that like, you have to find another job, mm. which is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, being responsible for other people, I think, has been really stressful for me. And being the sole person who's responsible to answer to stakeholders, to answer to my investors and having to build something from scratch and be taken seriously and prove myself in an industry that is pretty archaic and known for really only accepting people who have been in it their whole careers. And I'm talking like like entertainment, like Hollywood entertainment. Um, so there's just so many layers and forces, I guess, that are kind of working against me. Mm. But then that also drives me because as we've established, <laughs> I like to prove myself. <laughs> You're like, perfect. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I want to be able to say, I told, you to, I told you so to all the people who have doubted me in mm. this industry. or been like, what? Like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> am i and then i question myself <laughs> yeah in those um in those early moments and you speak about the the anxiety was magnitudes like bigger yeah uh doing your own thing versus like even the previous stops mm -hmm. um how did you handle the anxiety <laughs> and how did you you spoke about some of those like low moments mm -hmm. like how did you bounce back <laughs> still trying to figure that out um there's a lot of physical things that have helped you think anxiety is just in the brain and you have to do like mental things to help assuage it but like i said before slowing down even if it's when i'm getting a glass of water walking to the fridge slowly so i'm not just constantly frantic um meditation had helped in my most anxious moments and taking control like for me anxiety really stems from when i don't have control over a situation or there's a lot of unknowns and everything about starting your own company is unknown so taking control of things that i can control ha has really helped me like being consistent with going to the gym it's very mm -hmm. basic but boy oh boy when i'm consistently going to the gym i feel mag magnitudes better with my anxiety. It's also helped me to surround with pe surround myself with people who are only net positive <laughs> to my well-being. Mm. So frankly, I have decided that there's fewer people in my life that I actually want to spend time with than I thought. So my list of close people is smaller but better. And I spend a lot of time with my family. I'll if I need to detox and I'm super stressed, I'll just book a flight to Minnesota and work out of my parents' house for like a week and get fed by my mom visit my niece rose who's mm. a year old like squeezing my nieces is probably the best anxiety <laughs> relief that i can imagine yeah so that's just been like i found these these small but meaningful things that i can do that just helps take my mind away from the work anxiety yeah family in the gym <laughs> yeah I, I like that i i um i had a similar realization that like a lot of the times the i don't think you really cure the anxiety but the way that mm -hmm. you alleviate it yeah. is actually a lot of the times non-work related yeah totally it's um uh, for me a big thing was like meditation yeah was really huge or like just spending time outside mm -hmm. because it's actually in the moments that you're most anxious it's actually um in hindsight if you just analyzed what you were doing in mm -hmm. those periods 
you're probably inside way more. Yeah. You're probably eating like <laughs>、right. way less healthily. Right. You're、totally. probably sleeping way less. Yep. Like there's um, like there's clues there. Like there's like reasons、yeah. why it didn't just happen by yep. accident. Yep. And it's all about anxiety management. Like like you said, you're never gonna get rid of it. And it's something that I've been thinking about is. My anxiety has helped make me successful thus far in life, right? Like if I was just super chill, nonchalant all the time, I wouldn't have this drive、mm. to perform, to prove myself, to be competitive. So I'm trying to find this healthy relationship with anxiety. How can I use it to fuel me at the right times? The anxiety causes me to overprepare,、mm. which has worked well for me in really important meetings. I want to keep that. I don't want to get rid of it entirely. I just want to make sure it's not debilitating to me and holding me、mm. back. So that's、mm. been my latest mission. <laughs>、mm. Yeah. Okay. Here's where I want to go, and we can.、Um, yeah, I want to something that you've you've mentioned a few times is the therapist. <laughs>、uh, the importance of the therapist. I love therapist. her so much. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why is that? Why is that so important to you? And when did you kind of realize that that was like、mm -hmm. a need, like you、mm -hmm. needed to to put that in place? Yeah. Um. Well, I met her. I started therapy maybe like five years ago, for reasons we don't necessarily have to get into for why I started it. But I realized over time, and I was resistant to it at first, and I realized over time that just having a person to talk to. Where I don't have to perform in itself is very meaningful to me, because、mm -hmm. when I'm even in social situations, obviously at work, there is a level of performance in a way, because I feel like I have to be on all the time, and I feel like I have to impress people. So just to have someone to talk to who I can talk about that, it's like kind of meta. Like I talk about how. Hey Sam, you're the only person I feel like I don't have to perform in front of. Let's unpack why that is. But just having someone who has this objective perspective and can help me, she's truly helped me be a better person.、Hmm. And I think she's helped me be someone who is more pleasant to work with. So it's really helped me in my career, with my family. I just recommend everyone be in therapy, even if you don't think you need it, because、um, it just gives you another perspective.、Hmm. It's my favorite time of the week. I have therapy today. In fact, can't wait. Nice, <laughs> nice. How did you find her? Like, how can someone find their Sam? <laughs> um, it's hard. Um, someone. It was a recommendation from someone else. But what I will say is, if you are looking for a therapist and you go to therapy and you don't like the therapist, try a few more because it takes time to find a good one. I got lucky with Sam, but、mm. I have friends who have tried therapy. They don't like the first person that they come across. They're like, therapy's not for me. Like it's not that therapy is not for you; that therapist is not for you.、Um, so just keep trying. It's a lot of work, but it's probably the best investment you can make in、mm. yourself. Period. Yeah. It's also something that is coming from an immigrant family. Mental health is not a thing that you really talk about. There. When I first told my mom I was in therapy, she's like,、oh, "What's wrong?" <laughs> right?、Yeah. Like nothing's wrong. That's the connotation that it still has: is that you're crazy or whatever. But now she's starting to understand the value of it, and in fact. She said that I could find her a therapist, which is a huge milestone. Wow! Because、yeah. she needs one. She's not crazy, but she、mm. needs one. She has anxiety. I probably get my anxiety from my mom. Yeah. So that's been、um, that reminds me that I need to do that. She gave me permission a couple months ago, and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> After all of that. Yeah. <laughs>、um, it's important, I think, and like doing it proactively. Yeah. I think what you said is true, which is like. A lot of the times we do it reactively. It's like something、right. bad has to happen, right? And right. only once something bad happens, then yeah, if it's bad enough, it like pushes me to do therapy. Yeah.、Um, but it's powerful when you do it proactively. Definitely. Oh my gosh! And to do it for maintenance too, because when my therapist and I had decided to separate for a bit, I realized it would have been helpful to have stayed with her、hmm. because things were fine then. But who knows what's gonna come up? So if you've Been with a therapist, and you can talk about this hurdle that you've just arrived at. It's so much better than like, oh my gosh, I have this hurdle now. I need to go find a therapist, right? It's just better to have someone who has that history. And the earlier you can start therapy, the better, so they have the history of of、mm. you and your family dynamics and your relationship dynamics. It's never too late to start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It reminds me almost.、Um, 
my coach that I have a business is like, um, it's weird because I guess she's meant to be like my career coach, but then you almost get to the point where it's like, there's almost a bit of therapy in yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it was great working with her for the first year. But then actually, as we worked more and more, it gets better because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. she starts to just understand like who you are as yeah. a person. She sees you yeah. like your dad. Yeah. A hundred percent. And like the threads just make sense. And it's, yeah. um, she doesn't really give me advice often. It's not really like that. Like she doesn't tell oh. tell me like what to do, but she she knows better because she just has the history. Yes, she can. Oh she gosh. knows how I tend to exactly. behave. Exactly. Yep. Um. Okay. Here's where I wanna I wanna end with this. Um. One thing, like even when at the start of the conversation, mm-hmm. we spoke about like um like proving yourself. <laughs> proving yourself even yeah. when you were talking about your therapist you spoke about uh like how meaningful it was not having to perform yeah yeah um it's the same thread right it's like <laughs> that that it's the performance it's the proving it's yeah. the showing something yep. um why why is that so meaningful like having that moment mm-hmm. where it's like I don't need to show anything right now. I don't need to mm-hmm. demonstrate. I don't need to. Yeah. There's nothing that I need to show. I can just be comfortable. Like, what is the cost of proving yourself? Yeah. I mean, the cost of pro- having feeling like I have to prove myself constantly is that it's a constant anxiety. Um, and I honestly, I think that's why it, it, there's my therapist and then there's my nieces who are six, three, and one, who literally don't care what I do for a living. Like, they don't care how successful I am, where I went to school, any of that. It's like there's such a a small number of people, and a couple of my best friends too, there's such a small number of people where I feel like I don't have to talk about work. And they actually, in fact, don't ask about work because they don't care because they're just there to hang out with me. Like, even with my parents, I think it's only recently that I feel like it's always been about chasing the, the title, the Harvard, the Goldman, the whatever the next job is. And only now they're like, Nora really seems like she knows what she's doing, even though there might not be a big headline right now. And I feel like it's taken a while for me to get there with a lot of people who are close to me. And I will say, going back to what gave me the most anxiety when starting the company is that I suddenly went from being this anchor on a news network that was literally on TV, on social media a lot, interviewing celebrities and executives and really public facing to suddenly not being on camera and not being on a microphone. And that gave me a lot of anxiety because people were DMing me like, where'd you go? Why aren't you on TV anymore? What are you doing? And I couldn't really talk about this company for a while. And I was like, people are going to think that I'm not doing anything. And how am I supposed to prove myself if I'm building this company in secret? So that was a really big um, anxiety inducing point for me. But now it's honestly, it's the toughest thing for me is trying to be comfortable with not having something to show constantly or having the next milestone or the next press release that talks about like all my successes. I don't know, something that I'm constantly thinking about and still working through. I don't have a good answer for it. Mm. My therapist and I are literally working through all of that together. Yeah, that's that's such a powerful thing. And I think it's um, a lot of people that are just kind of like overachievers and it it almost starts in school with like the grades and then it carries on into your career. There's um, there's certain experiences that you can have Mm -hmm. that they they speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. So like when you go to Harvard or when you go to Goldman or when you're like um you say you're like a television anchor Mm -hmm. it it speaks for itself yeah yeah like there's a level of respect and validation and everything that comes with it that you get just from saying the title right right when and and i guess that is that's a difficult part of starting your own business which is (laughs) unless you're like i don't know universally successful right it doesn't speak for itself you you nailed it this is why i get stressed when i'm meeting new people and they ask what do you do because you have to explain it you have to explain the why you have to explain the how you have to explain where you are in the process you have to explain like what does that actually mean what do you what are the goals like there's so many more questions 
Whereas when I worked at Goldman, I could just say I worked at Goldman and we could literally move on from the mm. conversation. Even being a news anchor, like they'd have follow-up questions because it's a cool job to talk about, but I was excited to talk about it because it's something that people fundamentally understand. But now having to explain what you do, it's stressful. Mm. Um, and that's why I think when we're meeting new people, we should focus less on what you do for work. And I, I think about this all the time. Is like, how can I strike up a conversation with someone new on a first date or whatever without having to talk about what we do for work? And it's really hard. Mm. It's like really hard. So I like to emphasize the violin piece of things. I like to talk about Minnesota. I'm an avid indoor boulderer, or I was until I tore a tendon in my finger. Like that's something that I'm thinking about a lot with my therapist too, is who is Nora Ali outside of work? Mm. I still don't really have that answer. <laughs> do you yeah. have an answer? <laughs> yeah. No, we need to do another episode in a few years. We'll, <laughs> I know, right? We'll have the answer. We'll pick it yeah, up right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, oh I love gosh. this episode. This Life is hard, good. man. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. And just like, um, I feel that. I think, I think for me personally, I'm so much like in the hunt of like trying to achieve what I want. Yeah. That I haven't quite got to solving that problem yet. Yeah. Which is like... Um, at a certain point, you want to be able to tell your story without having to point to like some accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. You just want to be able. It goes back to being like wanting to be seen, right? Yeah. Being seen for more than just the accomplishments. Totally. Yeah. Which is, I mean, this is a whole other podcast topic, but I've been thinking about family a lot. And do I want like until recently, I was like, I don't really think I want kids. But now I'm like, well what is my life purpose then? It's just going to be career oriented unless I make a family. Mm. So now I'm like, do I want kids or do I want kids just to be able to do something that's not, <laughs> that's not work? And that's like a very bad reason to have kids. And then that's why you have, you know, parents who incessantly talk about their children because that does become who they are. Mm. Like you kind of transition from work being everything then to your kids being everything. So, yeah, like identity is really hard at every phase in life. And I think I'm at this crossroads now, just not just work wise, but making life decisions too. Mm. you know, like what am I doing with my life? Yeah. <laughs> What's the end goal? Yeah. When there was I came across a TikTok, which is where I get all my information. Um, <laughs> and it was like, if you close your eyes and you wake up in 20 years, what do you want to see when you open your eyes? And like, obviously, I don't want to see like awards for work that's not what i want to see when i open my eyes in 20 years like yeah maybe it's like kids hmm. maybe it's like a partner a life partner it's it's like family and relationship oriented what i want to see versus the career stuff but why am i putting 96 percent of my effort into my career stuff now if hmm. that's not helping me achieve that goal from 20 years hmm. we need to do another episode of like <laughs> <laughs> life goals <laughs> yeah we do <laughs> Oh, that's great i think that's a great question for anyone yeah anyone to ask and i think both questions are great mm. one is like the what do you want to see when if you opened your eyes and it was 20 years fast forward mm -hmm. but then like um also like what are you doing now yeah like the, the disconnect <laughs> right, right. i think is is important i'm doing nothing right now <laughs> to achieve waking up to a life partner i have hinge <laughs> that's it <laughs> I'm not That's even the only on check it. That I, have. I just have it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> we'll get there. It's a work in progress. <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure having you on. It's been so fun. Yeah, it's been yeah. really fun. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the channel. We're having fire conversations every week on the podcast. Before we end the episode, a quick word from our sponsor, Free Agency. What if I told you there is a good chance you're leaving money on the table in your career? It would kind of annoy you a bit, right? Well, Free Agency aims to stop that. They represent and manage talent in the tech industry. Here's how they do it. First, they provide you with a dedicated talent agent. Think about this as your career quarterback. They understand you and your career goals. Based on that understanding, they bring you suitable interviews at top firms. You focus on smashing the interview and together with their network, research, negotiation expertise, they will make sure you get a top of market salary. Stop job searching alone and start building your dream career today with free agency.